kind introduction and one, one of the things, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? I don't like to use microphones, um, so at any point, if you can't hear me, raise your hand and I'll take it up another level. Um, one of the things Adam did not mention to me, which I always mention when I am in Knoxville, just to be sure that we all know where I stand, I am a big Vanderbilt fan. Um, and, and I say this with the deepest sincerity. Is there any way that you can talk those folks over at the university into reconsidering the firing of Derek Dooley? If you would, those of us in Nashville who are Vanderbilt fans would greatly appreciate it. Um, because he managed to give us a victory at home which we hadn't had in 30 years um, and I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I'm sorry I didn't hear. Oh, Vanderbody. Uh, yeah, we'll, yeah, we're, we'll look. Um, first of all, uh, the talk we're going to do today is kind of a combination of three things. Uh, one is it's a combination of, of the two books that I have out. One is Images of Tennessee's Confederates and the other one is images of Tennessee's Union cavalrymen, but I also draw from a few people from the exhibition. So some of them are in the ex exhibit, some of them are not. And uh, we did a talk here a couple years ago on the cavalry book, so many of you may already have that. Uh, but if you're interested in the books, I will be glad to, to sell you one. Uh, they are being sold by your bookstore here at the East Tennessee History Center and be glad to sign those for you. They make excellent Christmas gifts, I might add. Um, but, um, and I'd like to, to brag on your sites in East Tennessee. I work with museums from one end of the state to the other and um, it's always a pleasure to come to East Tennessee because not only does the East Tennessee History Center do a fantastic job, but you have sites uh, all over East Tennessee that do a really good job and I encourage you to support them uh, go to their events, go to their programs. Uh, Adam and I spent the day yesterday visiting uh, Ramsey House, uh, Sam Houston Schoolhouse, um, preparing for the War of 1812 uh, Bicentennial Symposium that will be here in Knoxville in March of 2013. So I encourage you to, to get involved with that as well. Uh, the topic at hand uh, are 10 Civil War Tennesseans that you should know something about but probably don't. Now you're an educated audience, so some of these people are going to come as no shock to you. Um, and I will go ahead and forewarn you that we're not going to talk about Andrew Johnson, we're not going to talk about Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, we're not going to talk about Farragut, because those are people that you should already know about uh, and, and are pretty much well known. We're going to talk about kind of the next layer of people that were very important during the era but have almost been forgotten to history and that's what we're really going to talk about today. And this is a, a very brief talk and we're going to do a tour of the exhibit after this but uh, the first man and uh, this is the only man by the way that appears in both of my books. John Bell was one of the most important antebellum politicians, not only in Tennessee, but actually in the United States. John Bell is a, a Middle Tennessean. He spends most of his life in Nashville. Later will move up to Stewart County, up close to Fort Donaldson. Uh, and actually had served as Secretary of War uh, for a while under William Henry Harrison. And by the he had also served as Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. He's a Whig. Um, and one of the things you have to keep in mind is that when this great secession crisis erupted with the election of Abraham Lincoln is that Tennesseans were reluctant to leave the Union. I know that comes as a shock to many of you. Um, we actually for decades had been trying to keep the nation from being ripped asunder. In fact, Tennesseans time and time again uh, in the antebellum period had done everything they could to keep the nation being ripped apart. Uh, starting with the Nashville Convention in 1850 uh, which resulted in the Compromise of 1850. And John Bell is again one of these guys who's trying to keep the nation from being ripped apart. As you probably know in the election of 1860 you have Lincoln running on the Republican Party ticket. You have a Democratic Party that is split with a northern wing and a southern wing and so it didn't take a genius to figure out what was going to happen uh, with the Democratic Party split Lincoln was easily going to win well John Bell again in an effort to keep the nation from being ripped asunder creates another party 
And that party that he creates is the Constitutional Union Party. Their platform is pretty simple. Abide by the Constitution and preserve the Union. Now you have to remember too the geography and you have to remember the geography of where Tennessee stood within the nation. Tennessee, as another man we're going to talk about in a few minutes pointed out, was very well adapted for economic growth in the antebellum period. We conveniently sat halfway between the grain belt of the Midwest and the cotton belt of the Deep South. We had rivers that ran roughly north-south that connected the regions right in Middle Tennessee uh, and in West Tennessee and in East Tennessee. We also, in the 1850s, built railroads that in times of peace made us economically one of the most powerful states within the Union. However, when the war begins, those avenues of commerce become avenues of invasion. Now, remembering where we stood geographically, remembering that the states that would have the most to lose should war erupt, would have the most appeal with a candidate like John Bell. John Bell in the election of 1860 carries Tennessee, Virginia, and Kentucky. It's no coincidence that those three states would bear the brunt of the Civil War fighting because they indeed had the most to lose. Now we all know what, what happens though. Lincoln will end up winning the election. John Bell's three states are not enough in the Electoral College to matter much. And you then have the, the southern states starting to secede. John Bell um, chose to stick to his constituents. And when Tennessee decided to leave the Union, he too cast his lot with the Confederacy. But he said he, he thought he'd put his own noose around his neck by doing so. And indeed, it was the end of his political career. Uh, he lives pretty much at the end of the war in Stewart County, dies in obscurity, and now is just a footnote in American history as one of those also runs for president. But indeed, John Bell really did try to make an attempt to keep the nation from being ripped apart. Even, and he was, I will remind you, a union man in his heart of hearts. Now, this is William Bowen Campbell. William Bowen Campbell is born in Gillettsville, Tennessee. He serves in the Mexican War. In fact, he is Colonel of the First Tennessee, which will get the reputation as the Bloody First. And Campbell there uh, in the Mexican War will utter the phrase, Come on boys, follow me. He will use that phrase when he runs for governor. He will be elected governor. He will be the last Whig governor of Tennessee. If you've ever been to Fort Benning or the infantry school is to this day. What's the infantry soldiers uh, school? What is their the leadership school? It's come on boys follow me. <laughs> William Bowen Campbell is also a very important figure. He's a union man. He's also a slave owner. When Tennessee leaves the Union he casts his lot with the Union. Uh, many people thought that when Nashville fell he would be the man that would be tapped as the military governor. He was not. Andrew Johnson was, was of course became the military governor. Uh, now I say this in favor of William Bowen Campbell. A lot of politicians when snubbed like that would have probably just said to hell with it. Not William Bowen Campbell. He got behind Andrew Johnson as much as he could and tried day in and day out to make sure Tennessee got restored to the Union as quickly as possible. William Bowen Campbell, still with us today, Fort Campbell is named after him. And I will remind people too, it's always Fort Campbell, Kentucky. That's only because the post office is in Kentucky. 75% of the base is in Tennessee. Now, to switch to the Confederates for a moment, this man is Isham Harris. Uh, Isham Harris is born in Middle Tennessee but spends most of his life in West Tennessee and is elected as governor of Tennessee while he's living in Memphis. He is very much a pro-secessionist. Uh, 
And in fact, if you wanted to blame one single individual, which you cannot, by the way, uh, but if you wanted to blame one single individual for us leaving the Union and joining the Confederacy, this would be your most likely subject. And by the way, you can tell Isham Harris was a big uh, admirer of Bozo the Clown. Um, <laughs> He, he had this hairstyle his entire life, and this is a post-war image of him. Um, but Isham Harris uh, very much cast his lot with the Confederacy, and as governor, um, you know what ends up taking Tennessee out of the Union is the fact that Confederate forces attacked Fort Sumter. After that event, Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to come and put down the rebellion. Well, when this message was sent to Isham Harris, he responded, Tennessee will not provide a single man for coercion, but 50,000 if necessary for the defense of our southern rights and those of our southern brethren. Now keep in mind, when Isham Harris sends this telegram back to Lincoln, he's essentially taken Tennessee out of the Union. Now he did this, sent this message without the advice and consent of the state legislature, I would point out, um, who had a little bit different ideas and took a little bit slower approach to leaving the Confederacy, but nonetheless, Isham Harris is the man who will lead us out. Um, and Harris, unlike other politicians who got us into wars and then just kind of fade off into oblivion, I will say this in favor of Isham Harris. He took the field, not as a general, he took the field as a volunteer aide, uh, served as a volunteer aide to several different Confederate generals throughout the war, and it wasn't like he sat in the back either. Uh, some of you may know this. When, when, uh, when Albert Sidney Johnston is mortally wounded at Shiloh, he dies in the arms of Isham Harris. That's how close to the front Harris was. Uh, after the war, Harris will flee to Mexico, later to England, uh, he will eventually come back to Tennessee. Ironically, the man who signs his pardon had been a man that he was one of the most bitter, bitter political enemies before the war. The man who signs his pardon? Parson Brownlow. <laughs> William Driver. William Driver had spent most of his life as a merchant seaman. He was from Massachusetts originally. He had sailed around the globe. Um, when he retires, he retires to Nashville because his children had moved to Nashville. And he brought with him when he came to Nashville a big nautical flag that he had carried around the globe. That flag he had nicknamed Old Glory. During the secession crisis, uh, being a Union man, Driver takes the flag and sews it underneath a blanket that went over his bed. When Union troops arrive in Nashville in February of 1862, they want a large flag, a large American flag to fly from the state capitol. William Driver produces Old Glory. It's flown at the state capitol. Very soon, newspapers in the north pick up on this story about this loyal Tennessean and his reference to his old glory. There's a reason you call old glory, old glory to this day. It's William Driver, it's a Tennessee story, and one that's almost been forgotten. Now I will add another caveat to this. William Driver has a son who joins the 1st Tennessee Confederate Infantry Regiment. His son is killed at Perryville, Kentucky in October of 1862. Meanwhile his father is back in Nashville raising money to support the Union cause, to tell you how divided some of these families really were. And by the way, one of the things we have in the exhibition is the Bible carried by William Driver's son at Perryville, Kentucky. Alvin Cullum Gillum, and I promise we're not talking all about Unionists, we're going to get back to Confederates in a minute. Alvin Cullum Gillum uh, is born in Jackson County, Tennessee, in Gainesboro. He goes to the United States Military Academy. He ends up serving as a staff officer for George Thomas for a while. Uh, later he will raise the 10th Tennessee U.S. Infantry. But his main claim to fame is that he is Provost Marshal of Nashville, uh, but later he will raise, raise a cavalry brigade known as the Governor's Guard. 
He becomes very close friends with Andrew Johnson. He names his brigade in honor of the governor. Uh, and the governor's guard's claim to fame is that in September of 1864, the governor's guard, that cavalry brigade, rides into Greenville, Tennessee. And there in the early days of September, they kill one of the most famous Confederate raiders, John Hunt Morgan. Alvin Gillum will later, at the end of the war, command uh, several different reconstruction districts. But um, as you know, when Andrew Johnson is replaced by U.S. Grant as President of the United States, anybody that had shown any loyalty to Johnson in the Army is sent other places. <laughs> Gillum is shipped out to California to fight Indians. Uh, he gets very sick while there and he returns uh, and, and builds a home in Nashville known as Soldier's Rest and is actually buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery in Nashville. Uh, Mount Olivet, if you're not, not familiar with that cemetery, is famous because of all the Confederates buried there. Nobody remembers this famous Union general uh, that was buried there as well. Samuel Carter. I hope East Tennesseans should know about Samuel Carter. When I do this talk in other parts of the state, this comes as great news to them. Uh, but Samuel Carter uh, was a career naval officer, uh, remained loyal to the Union because of his outspoken loyalty to the, to, to the Union, is detached from the Navy to the Army, Re leads one of, the most, uh, er one of the earliest and successful Union raids into East Tennessee, uh, in 18, early 1862, late 1861, um, and he will end up commanding uh, cavalry for most of the war. At one point he's named Provost Marshal of East Tennessee, uh, and at the end of the war is actually commanding an infantry division in Sherman's army. When the war ends, he goes back to his old job in the Navy. He rises up to the rank of an admiral before he retires. He's the only man in American history to ever hold the rank of general and admiral. And he's a Tennessean. His home still stands in Elizabethan, by the way. Frank Cheatham. This is absolutely my favorite character from any war of any time period. Uh, Frank Cheatham, born in Nashville, born to fairly wealthy parents, he never really has to have a job, but he does fiddle around at various and sundry things, trying to find his way in life. <clears throat> and lo and behold, Frank Cheatham finally found his, finds his calling in life when the Mexican War erupts. He goes off with um, William Bowen Campbell as a company commander in the 1st Tennessee, serves in Mexico, and I will tell you, Tennesseans provided more troops to the Mexican War than any other state. But I'll also tell you this, most Tennesseans who went to Mexico did their job and decided to come home because a year in Mexico was more than you really wanted. <laughs> it was rough, ter terrain was terrible, the water was bad then just like it is now. Um, so most guys when they did their enlistment came home and that was it, not Frank Cheatham. When the 1st Tennessee's enlistment runs out, Frank Cheatham comes back. He raises the 3rd Tennessee Infantry Regiment. He will serve as its colonel. He goes back to Mexico. And unfortunately for Frank Cheatham, he ran out of war. Because um, the war ends and he again is like, well, what do I do with myself now? Though we're not fighting anybody. Well, lo and behold, one of the new acquisitions that we got out of the Mexican War was, of course, the state of California. And in 1849, what is discovered in California? Gold. Frank Cheatham decides he's going to go out to California and, and, and pan for gold. He gets out there and figures out pretty quickly that you can make a lot more money selling liquor to the miners than you can panning for gold. Frank Cheatham opens a saloon. And when I'm talking about miners, I'm talking about guys with picks and shovels, not, not little kids. But, but he probably was selling liquor to them too if they had the money, to be honest with you. But he makes a, a quite a bit of money selling, uh, operating this saloon in California. He comes back to Middle Tennessee in the eight, late 1850s. And because of his Mexican War experience, when Tennessee leaves the Union, he gets a pretty 
uh, high rank in the Provisional Army of Tennessee. He later will carry that into the Confederate Army of Tennessee. And, and I like to talk about Frank Cheatham because more Tennesseans served directly under Frank Cheatham than any other general in the Civil War. Cheatham's division of the Army of Tennessee was composed almost entirely of Tennessee regiments. Cheatham has a reputation as being a hard drinker and a hard fighter. He was reportedly drunk in the saddle at Murfreesboro. Um, in fact, the rumor that spread through the Army of Tennessee was that he and John C. Breckinridge were up before the night, uh, the night before the battle, drinking very heavily. Well, keep in mind that John C. Breckinridge is from Kentucky. <laughs> Frank Cheatham is from Tennessee. Last I checked, we kind of lead the world in liquor production, the two of us combined. So it would not surprise me that indeed those rumors were true. Um, Breckenridge probably sharing some bourbon with uh, Cheatham and Cheatham selling, sharing some Tennessee whiskey with, with, with Breckenridge. Um, but this reputation as a hard fighter is, is important. Um, during the Atlanta campaign, there is a, a place near Kennesaw Mountain. In fact, the hill now bears his name, Cheatham's Hill. And that hill was held by Cheatham's division in that battle and was heavily assaulted time and time again by Sherman's army. Uh, and during these assaults, there is a truce between the lines to pull out the dead bodies. During the truce, Cheatham who's probably running around just in shirt sleeves and a vest, he probably looked more like an old farmer than a general, goes up and plops himself down on top of the Confederate earthworks and just kind of watches what's going on. The Union soldiers recognize Frank Cheatham and start to come up to him with their autograph books to get Frank Cheatham's autograph. Uh, another episode during the Atlanta campaign, uh, Cheatham is sitting there on his horse uh, with his arms crossed, just kind of watching the men walk by. Again, they didn't recognize him. He looks more like a farmer than a general. And some 18-year-old soldier goes marching by and says, Come down off that horse, old man. I'll show you what war's all about. <laughs> Not realizing that it's Frank Cheatham. Uh, Cheatham, who's in his 60s at this point, jumps down off that horse and is about to box the boy's ears. Staff officers separate them, but it tells you what kind of pluck, what kind of uh, fighting mentality Frank Cheatham had. Uh, he does survive the war. At the end of the war he is commanding a corps in the Army of Tennessee. Um, he takes his reputation as a hard drinker and turns that into his own advantage. Uh, in the post-war period, among his many jobs, he becomes the celebrity spokesperson for Lem Motlow's Tennessee Whiskey. <laughs> you know Lem Motlow's Tennessee Whiskey today is Jack Daniels. A.P. Stewart. A.P. Stewart's born in Rogersville. He uh, attends the United States Military Academy. He's a mathematical whiz, so he's quite naturally drawn to the artillery. Uh, and he is actually teaching mathematics as well as philosophy at the Cumberland University in Lebanon, Tennessee, and also at the University of Nashville in the immediate post -war, uh, pre immediate pre-war period. Uh, in the Provisional Army, he will end up uh, being a, a big, particularly uh, involved in the creation of the, uh, the heavy artillery that would man the, uh, the forts at Henry and Donaldson and Island Number 10 and up and down the Mississippi, Cumberland, and Tennessee rivers. Uh, but A.P. Stewart will end up rising through the ranks of the Confederate Army and will become one of Tennessee's only two lieutenant generals. The other one is, of course, Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest. Exactly. But A.P. Stewart, very, very good general. They called him Old Straight. Uh, he was a, a very capable, very reliable general at the end of the war as commanding a corps in the Army of Tennessee. After the war, he goes back to teaching and ends up uh, uh, and, and is in business for a while and uh, later in life becomes one of the chancellors of the University of Mississippi. So you have to remind the Ole Miss people when they roll into town periodically that their chancellor was a Tennessean at one point. William Barksdale. Barksdale's born in Rutherford County. As a young man, he moves to Mississippi and practices law. 
When the war begins, he will raise a Mississippi regiment. Barksdale will ultimately command the Mississippi Brigade in Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. So Barksdale is always claimed as a Mississippian, but he is a Tennessean, at least by birth. Barksdale will lead his brigade in all the battles of the Army in Northern Virginia. Barksdale's Mississippian will be thrown into the fight on July 2nd, 1863 at Gettysburg, and there Barksdale will die on the field at Gettysburg. But again, a boy that I think we should reclaim. Um, very, very important figure in the Army in Northern Virginia. This man is Ben McCullough, also born in Rutherford County. And in 1835, Ben McCullough decides to go to Texas with a friend of his named David Crockett. Ben McCullough gets sick on the way to the Alamo. So he's not there when Davy is killed. McCullough will survive his illness. He will fight at the Battle of San Jacinto under Sam Houston when the Texans get their independence. He will later command a Texas Ranger Battalion serving with Zachary Taylor during the Mexican War. And when the Civil War begins, Ben McCullough of Tennessee, now of Texas, will end up casting his lot with the Confederacy. He will com uh, command half of an army of Texans, Arkansans, and Missourians to victory at the Battle of Wilson's Creek in August of 1861, but will die in 1862 at the Battle of Pea Ridge, Arkansas. But again, a Tennessee boy, um, most often associated with Texas now. I didn't want to leave out the ladies. Uh, and you, again, these are just a sampling of many, many thousands of stories that you could tell about Tennesseans during the war. But this particular lady is of particular importance. Um, this is Carolyn <coughs> Douglas Merriweather Goodlett, if that's not a mouthful. Um, she had a brother who was in the Confederate Army from Kentucky. Uh, he dies very early in the war. She actually divorces her first husband. It's almost unheard of in this time period. Relocates to Middle Tennessee and after the war marries a Confederate veteran. Because of her marriage to this second husband and because of her brother's uh, loss for the Confederate cause during the war, Mrs. Goodlett will spend most of her waking hours making sure that Confederate soldiers are not forgotten. She will mark graves. She will help mark battlefields. She will raise money to take care of Confederate veterans. In fact, you could argue that the Confederate veterans home that was created in Tennessee would have never been created if it hadn't been for Mrs. Goodlett and the ladies who rallied behind her. Mrs. Goodlett is the founder of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So even the, day, even the way we remember the war to this day is quite indeed a Tennessee story. And Mrs. Goodlett is a major player in that effort. Now, I always throw this image in. Um, this is General Lee, um, not Robert E. Lee, I will remind you. Uh, this is Henry Rene Lee, who was a, uh, never a general during the war. Um, he became a general later as a member of the United Confederate Veterans. Uh, and was actually the secretary general of that organization for a number of years. And this image is probably taken in the mid-1930s, and here he is looking at this B-10 Martin bomber. And I always wonder what's going through his mind. Um, you know, at his age, he may be wondering where the bathroom is, um, or may even not know where the hell he is. Uh, but I'd like to think that what's going through his mind, you know, if we'd only had these um, on that second day down at Shiloh, um, the war may have been a little bit different. Uh, but the bottom line is, is this. So, so, so what does all this mean? Why should we care? Well, here we are uh, in the midst of the Civil War sesquicentennial, 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And one of the things to keep in mind is that these men, um, and, and boys actually for many of them when the war began. Um, it, it's hard to fathom this, but when the war began, many of these boys had never left their home counties. Um, the war comes around and for the first time many of them take a train ride, many of them take a steamboat ride. 
Uh, they go to places that they never thought they would go. They saw things, quite honestly, that humans should never be allowed to see. Uh, and in my estimation, it matters very little whether they were wearing uh, Confederate gray or Union blue. Uh, the brave decision that these men made to join the armies is the thing that should be remembered about them. Uh, and, and it was almost a death sentence simply to join the army. Because even if you never witnessed combat, you may have been in occupation duty the whole war, simply the fact that you survived the food, the weather, and the water is a testament to their bravery. And you have to remember too, most of these men were volunteers. Given our state, again, an, an even greater claim to that title. But back to the initial thought here is that by the end of the war, they'd seen a lot of things. Some things, again, not things they wanted to remember. But by the time the last veterans die, jet airplanes are screeching across the sky. And while the Civil War sesquicentennial, 150 years ago, that seems like a long time. In reality, it's not. Because by the time the last veterans die, the last veterans die in many of your lifetimes. Their widows have died in my lifetime. This war that seems so far and so removed from us is still very much a part of us. It's who we are as Tennesseans. It's who we are as Americans. And it should never be forgotten. And it's, it's here all around us. That's one of the great things about being in Tennessee. Most of us can't throw a rock without hitting a Civil War battlefield. And if you haven't been to one, go to one. And one of the things I encourage any audience to do, um, tell your children and your grandchildren about how important it is. Take them to a battlefield. If it's like my child, she'll grumble about it. Um, but then she, or as she told me one time, Daddy, I don't care what we do on vacation. I just don't want to go do one of those old-timey gigs. Um, but regardless, I drag her to battlefields, kicking and screaming, and guess what? As we leave the battlefield almost every time, she'll start asking questions. Daddy, did they fight there? Did they fight here? And we've got to start putting those seeds or these battlefields will be lost, the history will be lost, and the history of our great nation will be lost. I appreciate your time. I'll be glad to sign books if you'd like me to. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer questions. Uh, again, thank you for having me. Anybody have any questions about anything? Yes, ma'am. This isn't a question, but and I was surprised recently to see a Civil War heritage map that, and I'm an Alabaman by birth, so. I don't have we don't hold that against you. <laughs> the whole state of Tennessee was the only state that the whole state is a Civil War heritage area. Yes. I was really surprised about that. And um, that that is unique, um, but. I would argue quite deserved. Um, there is not a county in this state where something of importance did not occur. Now, varying degrees of importance, but nonetheless, you can't find a county where at least one engagement did not occur. Now, sometimes it was simply guerrilla activity, but that's another part of the story of Tennessee during the Civil War. And, and, and I talk about this quite a bit, is that um, the only state that could compete with Tennessee in guerrilla warfare as far as violence was concerned was Missouri. Um, and I might argue that we even surpassed them. Um, the, there were guerrilla bands in every county, usually one northern sympathizing, one southern sympathizing, and they went at it. And the people who ended up suffering the most because of the guerrilla warfare were really the people that were just quite honestly wanting to be left out of the whole darn thing. Um, and that was usually women, children, and, and older men who hadn't been taken off into the armies. Um, and the guerrilla warfare in this state was horrendous. Um, and and uh, things that we cannot fathom occurred. Uh, flaying people alive, skinning people alive, uh, houses burning, uh, it, it was traumatic and it wasn't just here in East Tennessee, it wasn't just in Middle Tennessee, it was from one end of the state to the other. And if 
if I ever get the time, uh, my intent is to document as many as possible the gor different guerrilla bands uh, across the state. Um, the, the county that I have studied the most uh, is Sumner County. There were three guerrilla bands just in Sumner County. Um, and, and that's just on the Confederate side. And some of these guys really swore allegiance to nobody. Uh, they were just criminals. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Any? Yes, sir. I thought when I saw that picture, you were going to talk about Nathan Bedford Forrest, third or fourth. Oh, yeah. Um, could have, certainly. Nathan Bedford Forrest uh, I was the third, if I remember, or was it the fourth? I can't remember. Um, but Forrest had a... Uh, had a, a grandson who was a World War II bomber pilot who dies um, in Europe during the war on a test, t test flight, I believe. Uh, he was uh, on a bombing raid to France when he wasn't okay. to be there. It was a general. Yeah. And was the first general killed. And, and uh, another one, um, Buckner's son, um, is in World War II. And uh, if I remember, does Buckner's son die? At Okinawa. At, uh, I, I think he's on Omaha Beach. No, no, he was in the Pacific. He's in the Pacific, okay. Um, but yeah, there were a number of uh, children and grandchildren. To, you know. But he took after his grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Um, another one, um, uh, Douglas MacArthur. Arthur MacArthur. Um, was a member of the 24th Wisconsin and is awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions at Missionary Ridge um, and of course later goes to fame in the Philippines himself and then of course followed by Douglas there so there are a lot of connections between uh, the Civil War and, and, and World War II. Any, Patton's grandfathers had both been in Virginia regiments um, I think one of them dies at Gettysburg, if I remember correctly. But anybody else have any questions about anything? If you would like, we'll do a quick tour of the exhibition. Um, so we'll, I guess we'll readjourn over there.